introduce what I'm presenting uh, today. It's actually just one part of a much larger series of works that I did essentially when I was on this uh, residency at the Academy Schloss Sovietry. And this bit of context is uh, important because it was a it was quite a shift in the work that I was doing already. Which is uh, when I went to the Academy Schloss Solitude in 2007 for the first time, I had finished the first draft of my book, Addison Bhuleshwar, which was essentially the body of work that I developed studying Bombay, studying essentially the Bhuleshwar Kalpadevi area, getting into questions of uh, cities, citizenship, neighborhoods, the question of understanding architectural fabric, the question of uh, visual relationships and citizenship, etc. And uh, when I was there, a new series of questions started uh, emerging, which was also essential for me to, in a sense, uh, dissect my own Addison Bhuleshwar work, which was in that, at that time, it was also in the process of becoming the book, because we were going through sets of edited chapters, photographs, layouts, etc. And at that point, uh, architectural ornamentation was one of the things that was developing as a strong uh, area of concentration. The whole idea of uh, approaching cities through narratives was emerging, within which one of the essential concepts that I started working was with the idea of walking in the city. So walking as a methodological structure which partly has something to do with Benjamin, but in a sense it was not a takeoff from, from Walter Benjamin's work. The other thing that emerged very strongly was the idea of travel. And uh, not that travel or travel literature was something new to, new to work upon, but the quest became that in the process of travel, what is it about uh, places and spaces that emerges? which one misses and how does the experience of travel reconfigure the experience of home. So if Bombay and Alison Buleshwar was a home project for me, how would this kind of three years of practically uh, living outside Bombay, which actually began by living in Bangalore for a, for a year, then to Stuttgart, then to Budapest, then it was also the same time period that I started working on another city like Abu Dhabi. So there was, which came out of a project for the Venice Biennale in 2000, 2009. So there were a lot of these uh, uh, experiences also that kind of came in. And it was a question of translating and reworking on a lot of these experiences into at some point going back to Alison Buleshwar and seeing what is to be done again with Alison Buleshwar. So travel and within travel certain questions of, for example, the whole notion of maps and secondly the notion of archives emerged as two other spaces that are, or two other concepts or ideas or whatever that I started, started working with. So in a sense it was a three years of working with a lot of, uh, lot of different ideas but ultimately all of them falling into this basket project of places and cities. And to be able to approach and understand cities in a in a manner that obviously understands its kind of planning fabric, architectural fabric, because essentially I come from an architecture architecture background, who's then moved into the area of the humanities, uh, etc. So it, it so the, the so the so the whole thing of city as a planned object, or the whole uh, pressure of planning cities, designing cities, redesigning cities, solving problems, how much ever I may hate these kind of approaches to the city, these are always also there at the back of my back of my mind. And the approach to understanding cities also doesn't become to kind of romanticize the space of the city or to romanticize the experience of the city, but in some ways classically becomes to 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 struggle with what is the experience of urbanity. What does it what does a metropolitan experience mean? And that was a space where I thought that the whole uh, aspect of travel had something special to do with it and to investigate the aspect of travel would in a sense reinvestigate the whole uh, approach to understanding or studying a place or studying a city. So uh, a lot of things develop during these years depending on exhibitions or writings that I worked on. So there are about I think three or four exhibitions that I worked on during this, uh, during this uh, period. And 
a, a kind of an episodic essay that I that I developed during this uh, period again. So it's a bundle of uh, material which I'll just kind of go through it at one point in the in the PowerPoint. But I'm not going to really sit and discuss uh, all of it. If you have questions, I can surely surely answer them. I just thought of, uh, in a sense, uh, presenting to you one of the one of the projects which was also developed under the larger theme called Fear. So it was a large kind of a group show under the title of uh, Fear and where I kind of employed my obsession with travels and archives at the, at the moment into working into this uh, project. So the whole question at this point was that a lot of literature and a lot of writing is about the anxiety of places and characters that one doesn't know. So travel literature obviously does it, that the whole experience of travelling or the whole experience of discovering or the whole experiencing, experience of encountering something that is new results very often in hectic descriptions in one way or the other, directly or metaphorically, of places and characters. But then there was also this kind of extending this argument to saying that, that a lot of literature does it. So whether it is kind of more fictional literature, whether it is kind of straightforward travel writing kind of literature, whether it's a lot of essay literature, it produces a lot of uh, a lot of these characters and places within their work body. So this project became actually like extracting some of these descriptions and making an archive. So uh, this became some kind of an exercise that, anyways, I was reading a, 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 a like a like a lot of material. I was I was like picking out books and just reading them and kind of putting them away halfway read things like that. So I was doing a lot of this kind of reading, spending time. Also, when you you know that at a residency you also have time, which is kind of pressures off from your jobs of teaching, things like that. So you have the freedom to do that. And it was slowly kind of getting organized into certain descriptions, certain characters, certain places, certain people, etc. And I started extracting this, this uh, like quotes, descriptions, passages from these and started developing some kind of a proxy, proxy archive. So it was also making into a, making, making, uh, literally performing the creation of an, of an archive. And then the idea was to kind of pin up the archive like an like an exhibition. But what it also generated in the in the process is I kind of developed uh, 80 sheets like this, and each sheet is kind of one quote, one passage, which also a lot of them uh, have my own have my own writings that I was doing at that at that point in at that point in time. And these were completely uh, pulled out of any reference material. The whole project has a reference list, which technically indicates to you which quote or which text comes from which book, which passage, which page, etc. But otherwise the quotes are, quotes are kind of uh, out and, they, and then they became also this kind of a box project which I kind of mass produced after, after some time where you could actually there was a, there was a device uh, set up to be able to make stories by combining pages yourself. So in a sense it became an open book uh, project which also had something to do with an exhibition I did two years ago with architecture drawing cabinets, which I converted them into some kind of open book uh, archiving archiving system. So where I used the architecture drawing archiving system to document my travel, travel photographs and writings, but the way they kind of connected from one tray to the other, they became again this kind of a process where you could literally open them like pages in a in a book. So these have been kind of constant themes that have come back and back and forth. What I want to do is kind of to read through about, I think there's, there's one compilation of about 20, 20 pages and I want to read, read, through, read through that and then just kind of show you uh, images of some of the exhibitions which I've mentioned just to give you an idea and finally to show you how this uh, work, work looked. Why I thought of bringing this into this uh, context was, was simply the, the question of uh, travel and space. And travel and space has essentially something to do about time with me. So it was my simple understanding of if I have to bring something into the context of a, a conversation around time, this was the simple thing for me to, me to do. Maybe he needs a new Plato to redeem himself, I suggested. But he had vanished. All that remains is a tragedy and a rare translation of Fleur's Dumas. 
when you are walking along the street at night and a man visible from a long way off because the street slopes up in front of you and the moon is full comes running towards you you don't go for him even if he is a weakling dressed in rags even if there is someone running after him and shouting you let him run on because it is night and it is not your fault that the street slopes up in front of you lit by the full moon and anyway perhaps the two of them have staged the chase for fun perhaps they are both after a third man perhaps the first is being pursued without cause perhaps the second is out to kill and you would become an accessory to murder perhaps the two men are ignorant of each other's existence and are simply running home to bed each one each on his own initiative perhaps they are sleep walking perhaps the first one is armed in any case haven't you a right to be tired didn't you drink all that wine you're happy not to be able to see the second one anymore either in my early years whenever i went for a walk i used to enjoy peering through horizontal gratings which allowed me to pause even before those shop windows that overlook the shop opening into the pavement the shop provided a little sun and ventilation to skylights in basement apartments down to the The skylights almost never reached the opening but were themselves underground hence the curiosity with which i gazed down through the bars of every gate on which i had just set foot in order to carry away from the subterranean world the image of a canary a lamp or a basement dweller sometimes though after i had looked for these sights in vain during the day i found the situation reversed the following night in my dreams there were looks coming just from such cellar holes that froze me in my tracks images form faded it was as though i were mentally editing a motion picture the walls are red and as manson sits on the blind carpet shuffling tarot cards he says it's hard to read yourself somewhere he says he's got the skeleton of a 7 year old chinese boy disassembled and sealed in plastic bags i think i might make a chandelier out of it he says somewhere is the bottle of absinthe he drinks despite the fear of brain damage here in the attic are his paintings and the working manuscript for his new book a novel he brings out the designs for a new deck of tarot cards it's him on almost every card manson as the emperor sitting in a wheelchair with prosthetic legs clutching a rifle with the american flag hung upside down behind him manson as the headless fool stepping off a cliff with grainy images of jackie o in a pink suit and jfk campaign poster in the background it was a matter of reinterpreting the tarot he says i replied the swords with guns and justice is weighing the bible against the brain he says because each card has so many different symbols There is real magic, ritual element to it. When you shuffle, you're supposed to transfer your energy to the cards. It sounds kind of hokey. It's not something you do all the time. I like the symbolism much more than trying to rely on divination. I think a reasonable question would be, what's next? He says, about to deal the cards and begins reading. More specific, what's my next step? One thing strikes me as remarkable now the audacity with which I went to a boarding house all the rest seems to have begun and followed as naturally as possible what a lovely recollection it is nothing in my career since is so lovely as our life then was scarce a trace of what may be called the shipiousness wasn't had the priest blessed it by the hands of matrimony it would have been called the chaste pleasure of love and affection as the priest has nothing to do with it it will be called i suppose bc immorality i have often wondered if her husband found out that she was not a virgin and if not whether it was owing to some skill of hers or to his ignorance i heard afterwards that they lived happily after back in his room across the street blue pours himself a glass of brandy sits down on his bed and tells himself to be calm he drinks of the brandy sip by sip and then pours himself another glass 
As his panic begins to subside, he is left with a feeling of shame. He is postured. He tells himself. And that's the long and short of it. For the first time in his life, he has not been equal to the moment. And it comes as a shock to him. To he see himself as a failure. To realize at bottom, he is a calm. Quinn picked up the Marco Polo and started reading the first page again. We will set down things seen as seen, things heard as heard, so that our book may be an accurate record, free from any sort of fabrication. And all who read this book or hear it may do so with full confidence, because it contains nothing but the truth. Just as Quinn was beginning to ponder the meaning of the sentences, to turn their crisp assurances over in his mind, the telephone rang. Much later when he was able to reconstruct the events of that night, he would remember looking at the clock, seeing that it was past 12, and wondering why someone should be calling him at that hour. More than likely he thought it was bad news. He climbed out of bed, walked naked to the telephone, and picked up the receiver on the second ring. Yes, there was a long pause on the other end and for a moment. The kitchen was where they found the bulk of the guests, a dozen or so of them improvising a concert of contemporary music, conducted by the master of the house. He was dressed in a green and grey striped dressing gown, with leather babooshes on his feet and a canonical lampshade for a hat, and sat astride a straw-seated chair, beating time with his left arm, raised, and his erect right index finger close to his lips as he repeated laugh, roughly every second and a half trying to stop himself laughing. Softly, softly, catchy monkey, softly, softly, catchy monkey, softly, softly, catchy monkey, etc. The musicians slumped on a sofa which had no reason to be where it was, or wallowing on cushions performed to the conductor's gesticulations, either by banging forks, ladles and knives on diverse kitchen utensils, or by mimicking more or less successfully the sound of some instrument with their mouths. There was no one in the living room where a François Hardy record, Se à la moi à quel je pense, carried on turning on the gramophone, turned it. Turning, 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 turning. He wandered through the stations, he wandered through the stations. Then, as if inside the body of Paul Auster, waiting for Stillman to appear. He looked up at the vaulted ceiling of the Great Hall and studied the fresco of the constellations. There were light bulbs representing the stars and the line drawings of the celestial figures. Quinn had never been able to grasp the connections between the constellations and their names. As a boy, he had spent many hours under the night sky trying to tally the clusters of pinpricks lights with the shapes of bears, or bulls, archers, water carriers, but nothing had ever come of it, and he had felt stupid, as though there were a blind spot in the center of his brain. He wondered if the young Auster had been any better at it than he was. Not that any of it could ever be forgotten. That second floor apartment, for instance, on Stettelbaustrasse. Naturally, I have no idea who, but I might be interested in any of this. Certainly, I don't want to write a travel journal. I can describe only what is mine. Let's say, the story of my loves. But maybe not even that. Since I don't think I could ever begin to talk about the larger significance of mere personal experiences. And since I don't believe, or more precisely don't know, whether there is anything more significant than these otherwise trivial and uninteresting personal experiences. I'm ready to compromise. Let this writing be a kind of recollection or a reminder. The action is set in an area quite reminiscent of the Italian lakes, not far from an imaginary city which the author named Valdrada. The narrator is a painter. This time, Abdu could not contain himself, pounced on Hakim and picking him up like a child despite his laughing protests and provocative cries, threw him down on the bed, pulled off his pants and threw himself on top of him. He made love to him violently, ravishing him in a way 
he had never before and causing Hatim to scream out loud more than once from the pleasure and the pain. Abdu slaked his lust in Hatim's body three times in less than an hour without uttering a single word as though he were enthusiastically performing an unwelcome task in order to be quit of it. When they were done, Hatim lay stretched out naked on his stomach and closed his eyes in an ecstatic swoon like one who was drugged or asleep and wanting never to awake from this delicious dream. Abdu meanwhile remained stretched out, staring at the ceiling and smoked two cigarettes without saying a word. Then he jumped up and started putting on his clothes. Hatim became aware of what he was doing, pulled himself up into a sitting position on the bed and asked him anxiously, where are you going? Abdu continued to lie on his back, in silence, staring at the ceiling with his arm under his head. Hatim finished his cigarette and poured himself a glass of whiskey, which he tossed off in a single gulp. Then he went back and sat and sat next to Abdu and said quietly, Listen, my darling, our Lord is big, and He has true mercy, nothing to do with what the ignorant shakes in your village say. There are lots of people who pray and fast and steal and do harm. Those are the ones our Lord punishes. But as I am sure that our Lord will forgive us because we don't do anything, anyone, any harm. We just love one another. Abdu, please don't make things miserable. Tonight's your birthday and we are supposed to be happy. Abdu continued to lie. If he does not discover, he foresees, he promises, he directs. Under each tiny leaf of his forest of dreams, the fruit which the future will harvest lies hidden. This entire book is a golden bow. There were more than a dozen of us in the room now. We were crowded around the TV set watching carefully, minutely looking at every face we could see. There was nothing to be seen except crowds. Naveel had vanished into the anonymity of history. There were more than a dozen of us in the room now. We were crowded around the TV set, watching carefully, minutely looking at every face we could see. There was nothing to be seen except crowds. Nabi had vanished into the anonymity of history. The half-demolished building catches my eye from the car. Words glimpsed through the razor wire. Stay, stay, stay seem to talk to me directly, although I know they are just messages from one demolisher to the other. Keep this wall, lose that one, red signs about the little. That evening looking properly at your photograph, I realized that these words are a response to what is written, two stories above the elephant. Above wisdom, even, come. The building in your city beckoning, the buildings in mind leave. For us to stay with them, to be allowed to stay themselves. This city that people are constantly leaving and coming back to and leaving again. This was once a fine old colonial house called Rhodes House, a home of Cecil John himself. In recent years, it was a trendy nightclub, the kind with a red velvet robe and bouncers in tuxedos and models and minor celebrities, more London than Cape Town. Now its insides are turned out, exposed to anyone's eyes, there are no bouncers now, but a high razor wire fence marks the perimeter and there's a security guy in a black uniform. It's a temporary car lot now. He's guarding only parking spaces. He turns his face away when I bring up my camera, but he's smiling too. Gregory Samsa woke up from uneasy dreams. One morning he find himself changed into a giant bug. He was lying on his back, which was of a shell-like hardness, and when he lifted his head a little, he could see his dome-shaped brown belly, banded with what looked like reinforcing arches, on top of which his kilt, while threatening to slip off completely at any moment, still maintained a precarious hold. His many legs, pitifully thin in relation to the rest of him, threshed ineffectually before his eyes. What's happened to me, he thought. There was no dream. His room, a normal human room, except that it was too small, lay peacefully between the four familiar walls. Above the table, which was littered with a collection of drapery samples, Samsa was a traveller, hung the picture that he had recently cut out of a magazine and mounted in an attractive gilt frame. It showed a lady in a fur hat and a boa, sitting up straight and holding up an enormous fur mark that entirely concealed her forearms. Gregory's gaze shifted to the window and the murky weather 
raindrops beat audibly on the zinc windowsill. Made it feel quite magical. Why don't I go back to sleep and forget all the fooling about? The masonry of the walls above has become brittle. Brittle to our mirrors. It is not that I have never seen these peeling walls before, the flatness of space before, the Russian flourish of weighted materiality in dreamed landscapes. But today I saw it reflected in transparent mirrors. Do you believe me? Of course, of course I believe you. I walked out of daylight and its darkness into the darkness that I want to disappear in. Lost in that darkness were streets of vanity strewn with lights that shone only for me. The lights of glitter that bade me fresh for a walk deep in the insides of the world. I had entered to be found again and again. To be found again and again. Was I lost somewhere? I did not know that. By any simple calculation, I was lost. Not sure where I headed, but I know I was at rest as never before. The womb I had entered to was not birth and not death, but the life that I could now live by for a few more moments. Where was this place that was the womb I was searching for? Where have I landed? I am still walking, shock by shock, as it wears, it shows me on display, as every kind and unkind shopkeeper makes the adequate gestures, inviting me to buy, to shop. I only continue to walk this street. Is this street running in circles? Am I repeating my walk again and again? Am I on replay mode? The street is flat and never ending, but every moment is a fresh one. The street is same all through and through, but the moments are all new. A full basket of new moments I sprinkle on the street and make it my own. It's my street, but I do not want it. It's nice as long as this street is a stranger to me, no home for me. How many streets can I continue to walk and know, discover and unearth? Did they exist before me or did I discover them? Discover or excavate or simply create, maybe recreate. Where will this street head to? Maybe that is of no consequence. As long as I have a street to walk on, to think on, to live on, to sing on. A street where I can sing my song as loud as I wish and no one will stop me. Maybe no one can hear me on this street. Do we all know each other? All of us on this street, I mean. Do we know each other? Do we see each other? Do we smile at each other? Do we need anything? I'll just go through a series of these images. Uh, what happens is you, it's possible to make a series of these uh, strings. And uh, there was, there's also another area that I've been kind of trying to think and work on is that when we talk of uh, places or things like cities and architecture, we very often uh, do not realize that there are layers within within buildings, for example, that we very often talk of cities only as streets outside, but we completely forget that we very rarely know interiors of spaces. So also in this project, partly an obsession has been to pick out descriptions of interiors of, of buildings and, and spaces. And even in the city that you live, you, very, you know very few interior spaces. You only know interiors of homes which belong to your relatives or your, or your friends, which actually is a very small number of things to know in the city. You, you live and at the same time kind of completely uh, getting involved and engaged with uh, human beings as, as very uh, individual characters and characters that kind of develop their own own worlds and spaces which at one point or the other you kind of always always encounter so in a sense the whole uh, question of uh, working on some kind of a, some kind of an experience of urbanity or modernity this project started kind of uh, developing a lot of the pieces uh, have a certain personal ring, the selections that uh, happen. A lot of them also became kind of, you know, do you believe me? Yes, I believe you. These kind of ones or uh, nothing to tell, nothing but the truth. These are also obsessions of any kind of research project, that they have an obsession to be able to document something correctly. They have an obsession that somebody will believe the project at the end of it. So there were also quotes which were selected in or during the description of places which kind of, in a sense, internally uh, talk about or mock at the structure of an archiving or a research or a documentation, documentation uh, exercise. So, actually when I was working on this project, the earlier idea was to 
work for the exhibition, but once I developed these uh, plates, I really didn't feel like putting them up because they became kind of very, very personal. You're working like on a dweller's uh, scale of working on something very, very small. And to kind of put them up on a wall, which you will, which you will see, I found it kind of a little violent. And obviously, the guys who were curating the show were kind of pissed because two days before, I said that I can't have these sheets go up on the on the wall. Obviously, for compulsions, I had to ultimately do the pinning up of the sheets on the on the wall. But they continuously, luckily, remained this kind of a tapestry because a lot of people came back saying that there is this whole kind of a tapestry of text that you that you see. And the moment you start reading piece by piece these pages hung, there is something that like a personal chord or you feel that there is very personally, uh, these pieces are kind of very clearly selected or not selected or whatever something is something is happening. So it also maintained the scale which was something very uh, important for me because again when you are working with cities and architecture, you are working with these scales where certain scales work on certain kind of generalities and certain scales work on very personal and, and most kind of uh, visual or urban details are always uh, poised on this kind of generality versus the detail uh, equation. Uh, just kind of quickly uh, going through the range of projects and then in the end you see this uh, last one. Uh, this is the German Falk uh, map where the map opens in a very curious uh, way. And the whole idea was to use that structure of the map and some of the work I had done already onto that particular map. But as you see, a lot of the work has been kind of collecting and collating information and the collation has been various avatars. So the Alison Bullishore book was one avatar of the, of the work, but kind of developing catalogs, something in the format of the 19th century design catalogs, was another, another exercise. And the idea was to develop 10 pages for a catalog, I've developed only, only two. But uh, a lot of traveling kind of translated into these three, three basic ideas and collating images and ideas into three, three broad categories. One was walking, the other was seeing, and the third was collecting. And these became kind of primers for me to kind of talk and access uh, material and hence access experience. Okay, this was the archive I, I, I mentioned, which was the very early form of converting the architecture drawing table into archive, which also was the early avatar of me collecting uh, essays, collecting kind of extracts from different parts, and not always bothering. I always kind of maintained a record of where things came from, but when you kind of meet with it, you don't have to really bother about its context immediately. You can use it as a second reference already. And there was some kind of a bibliography that developed here because as I said the references are always there so the material is also kind of you know so they also came very specifically from certain flea markets of this whole obsession that when you travel you travel to a flea market. So it was also performing travel in certain certain ways. So this was the kind of the archive that, that was the very early of the Then this was another exercise which I which I did was actually pasting a lot of images from Bombay on a castle on a kind of a very baroque 16th century ornamental castle in, in Germany. So the reflection and the images were kind of overlapped. And it was summer, so it worked very well in the in the day. But actually all these images are from Bombay. This was the castle. And this is what this is how the exhibition worked, and it actually was uh, put up in two parts of the building, one near a door in a kind of a circular corridor, and the other was near a window. So it had this sense of being at two openings in a in a building, and it was a vast amount of uh, text. Because I had this little obsession with kind of laboratory spaces, there was also this thing of using these kind of cased glass boxes and putting some of my very early sketches, writings, also like uh, Piranesi images or kind of image, uh, collected images and postcards from flea markets or museums but always which had a connection to the work. Like I found a postcard of, the, of a theatre set, which the, like a whole theatre that is just assembled on site in a flea market or to kind of get a jigsaw puzzle of a Bruegel painting. 
so these were the things which also kind of connected to the whole uh, jigsaw structure sometimes of my of my work where it was a certain sense of collecting which did not have any form and shape but inherently there was a structure that kind of added up all together in developing some idea of whatever subject that i was working on so in a sense it was an exposition of a huge amount of text and as you can notice that i did work on the graphics of it also so there was a lot of working with 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 graphics actually so it was sometimes also certain sentences were bundled up inside certain senses sentences were repeated or there was a certain way of kind of this mobius strip there was a, there was a there's a text which is about the mobius strip very poetic text about the mobius strip which was kind of worked out in that sense so there was also a lot of working with the graphics of the of the image because ultimately it was only text on the wall that went up and kind of people just uh, people read and at the end of the exhibition i did not dismount it i just said that people can take away parts of the exhibition towards the end of it so actually the a lot of sheets started disappearing from from the exhibition yeah this is actually the map which this it's really what like blown up like here because of the projection but actually it's uh, i reversed the map and a lot of this information got converted on the back side of the map and when you refold it the map opens up like a multi sided uh, book actually yeah. but essentially my interest was to kind of uh, just present this particular this particular project because it had this very clear thing of making a proxy travel abstract uh, archive like extracts of travel travel accounts or descriptions of places into this kind of an archive because i i had been compiled around 80 80 sheets and then i just uh, multiplied them i think five or six times so i had about 400 odd sheets to be pinned up between the between the two places and now actually a lot of this was as i said it all worked project by project but now it's getting compiled into a, another book so there it's kind of getting compiled more into the thematic format so whether it's walking scene collecting as one particular chapter or the details of travel and organization coming into another chapter things like that also there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of details actually which i'm not getting into right now like the whole question of strangers so like when i was talking of characters there's uh, jane jacobs who essentially describes the city as a characteristic space place made up of strangers and that was another and the whole question of the strangers has been picked up by a lot of people talking about cities like later as you kind of move on or the whole kind of uh, walter benjamin melancholia that you kind of see also in the description of cities but also entering into the essential modern experience of what the modern metropolis uh, meant so it played or it kind of also there were there were these kind of things that were entering the project as i was kind of looking more closely or working more closely with all of these uh, characters or readers and things like that so there were details like this which are actually a part of the part of the project but actually i can like stop here and if you have any questions i can answer thing about a, a travel structure and which which for me also overlap with the residency structure that it basically allows you to kind of really be with things over a period of uh, time so a lot of these were very uh, there were small parts or projects or ideas that kind of developed and at the end of the day you know that they are all developing within your larger structure of your research project or or work and uh, now when i'm trying to put a lot of it together there are a lot of kind of links etc etc developing but the early part remains where you kind of just work with ideas and and projects and you have the freedom sometimes of leaving an idea and then kind of going back to it now when i'm trying to compile the book or whatever then you're kind of revisiting some of these ideas trying to kind of investigate them a little theoretically also more and things like that. on the uh, images from bombay and the window panes and the texture very interesting have you done more of that i mean you want me to see more no i have been done have you been doing more of that in different spaces in different no yeah it's just uh, one exhibition that i that i did which 
which was again like the the broader theme was uh, fetish and consumption and uh, i did the uh, i did this kind of a bit of a exhibition and presented a concept paper which also basically went into the conversation on monuments and histories and again then linking monuments to and histories to the whole notion of imagining places and either home spaces or travel spaces etc so it was that kind of a thing but it was also partly came from my obsession on my work with architecture ornaments and talking about essentially the 19th century where images travel and images practically were in a sense became international images the images were kind of uh, which is why the you know the the works of all these collectors and the whole idea of collecting also then becomes so again it's a obsession through many through the kind of 17th 18th century but 19th century again with the exhibition etc the whole notion of collecting collecting random objects and then developing a story from random object starts emerging very strongly especially with the with the world fairs and the world exhibitions beginning 1851 london and then paris and things like that so in a sense all the works have those kind of uh, you know links that are that are there somewhere somewhere behind yeah. but this was also lucky the site the site allowed me you have the buildings are elliptical and you have this kind of a very small castle that is there so it's a very small but very pretty kind of uh, castle and the castle fronts the biggest baroque garden that you have actually and then you have these elliptical buildings which have these glass windows so and because it's uh, they have double glass windows so you have to open the glass windows and slide the photograph inside and with the summer sun it it worked it also had a thing of working from inside because at one point they merged which is actually when you're between the two buildings but when you're inside because the way the corridor is very dark it's a clear cut and paste so then it's a clear cut and paste so a lot of people don't realize what's happening from the outside then realize that okay these photographs are just being pasted on the castle but that that had essentially to do with visual objects traveling across different places and either getting completely used up there or also losing the sense of where essentially certain elements or certain visual objects belong to but they don't essentially always belong to specific places but they do develop their own own histories in a certain way or they are pushed on with a particular with a particular history some of the texts in this piece uh, are yeah. it's or uh yeah this is actually this is the same thing this is one set of 80 sheets at the 70 or 80 sheets mm -hmm. and this i just kind of printed five times the whole set so i had like 400 sheets and then i had printed them out yeah so there are uh, four of each in sort of yeah yeah four of each four of each yeah. um i have a question yeah this is more like uh, i'm glad what you did was to me like you know you were of you know at sure at that point of time at that place you know and you spoke about walking talking collecting i mean yeah. the original what the game was concept was you know you walk you talk you can you collect experience and then put it up on your thing mm -hmm. um but you are like right now in this century mm -hmm. you are like collecting it in a different way on together a different medium different Contain different objects. So I mean, could you? And also, like you know, flattery is very important when it comes to describing architectural space in films, especially in your realist films of the post-war period. I think. Yeah. So I mean, uh, you know, I'd like for you to know because since you've done such elaborate, such elaborate project on, like you know, walking and collecting, like you know, I mean, talking about the space and. Uh, how do you see like the evolution of this of of the flanion i mean because i really not talk to like you know ask anyone this mm -hmm. right now like, you know but could you please talk about see, i'll uh, i'll tell you very uh, frankly that uh, my introduction in a much stronger way to benjamin and hence bodiler hens flanery etc happened practically post alice in buleshwar so in a sense it was also the whole sense of walking or being lost in a place had become some part of some part of walking and it, it's funny that uh, 
the director of this institute who's also kind of somebody who's read Benjamin quite well, he said, you know, I still cannot let myself do this, that I cannot go to a city and not have read anything or taken a map in my in my hand. So at one level that that kind of allowing yourself to be kind of taken by chance or taken by the by the way the place or the street moves is something that is important. But when I got to uh, there's also another experience which I've not uh, really discussed. Was the whole point of uh, being in a place where you don't know language, being in a place where you can't access material and literature. Say you know you want to you go to New York and you want to know about the city, you can pick up five books and read them. At least five you'll get in English if nothing more. Okay, more sure, but I'm just saying. You go to Germany, even the travel literature, funnily, touristic literature, funnily, is sometimes in Germany. So, so it also kind of makes you realize, like which kind of I was doing with the Alice project in, in Alice in Malaysia project, but I didn't realize the the whole employment of seeing, and that combines with the whole whole idea of accessing space physically, and kind of seeing where seeing is becoming and accessing not just of registering what you're seeing, but the combination of walking and seeing is literally becoming like a laboratory process of you know mixing two things and a third thing kind of. Uh, Emerges because working in an area like Puneshwar was not working with archives. You did not have archives which said, you know, which architect designed what. You have the 19th century maze of images, where crazy images that you have seen in kind of a Jyotindra Jain collection, all of Bikaner collection, emerging in buildings of buildings of Puneshwar, and you're know, really trying to wonder why. And then over a period, I also started, you know, picking up patterns which I would see everywhere in the world. So you have a certain pattern which you will just see repeating in different parts of the world. So it also became some kind of a, uh, that, that the whole idea of walking and seeing was some kind of a combination to your thinking thinking process. And then the, the collecting I think becomes the kind of the third obvious obvious thing for me which is why the kind of the obsession with the map and the archive, archive begins. Because the map in a sense claims to give you a route. Which, which at the end of the day is as random and abstract as being in a place without, without, uh, without a map. And the whole notion of the archive, where the kind of the archive in your, in your, in your process of walking and seeing is, is constantly being developed, is constantly being worked upon, and then you start working with choices of what starts entering your, or your archive. So for me, the flannery extended, or I, I concentrated on the word walking because that kind of physical exercise of walking and kind of using the so you know it's it's this it's this thing that you know when you read something you have the imagination that you have understood it but what you basically understood is the language part of it not necessarily that you always got the subtext or the or the sentence in between two lines kind of a kind of a thing with visual you are challenged much more on that because again there are very few visuals which allow you like you see a, you say okay this is Krishna Kalyan and then bracket. Okay? But you suddenly get surprised because the rest of the building looks like a gothic structure and suddenly you have a Krishna Kalyavartan image coming into the picture. Or suddenly you see kind of cows and elephants emerging in a, in a way. Or suddenly you see old men being repeated in architectural patterns constantly. So these were kind of, kind of more, uh, these kind of visual challenges that you picked up and you kind of started kind of collecting them and then sorting them out in, in some way or the, or the other. So I think what I was... Probably what was happening is that what I was not doing literally in my practice of working as a as a researcher who's trying to kind of work with the city, these exhibitions became moments where I purposely kind of then re-performed the archive or re-performed the library to sort out uh, to sort out material and, and data. And I enjoyed performing I think the the act much more than literally literally doing it also. And this data that you collected are all in the form of photographs or which you did or like yeah, see, I collected, obviously I collected photographs. I I did the performance of the collecting postcards in flea markets, although I didn't do it everywhere. But there were certain flea markets I, I went and just uh, picked up. And with Europe, you get a lot of these ruined pictures. So somehow there were these uh, impregnable ruins, or you know, you have a lot of these, uh, like you have the photograph of a mountain range and then a travel path marked along it. So a lot of images that somehow connected with either toys, somehow theater, travel, places, like ruinous places, I collected those that I, I had. I collected a lot of literature. So I picked up books on places and travel quite a, quite a lot. So it was it was a lot that came out of that. But otherwise it was spending a lot
lot of time walking and uh, spending also what do you say like uh, spending times in in markets bars so also places which are general city spaces which just you did you do things just to spend time in places so spending time in places was was part of the part of the Obviously, like people like Kafka, Paul Auster, they became like very good, uh, you know, on the way to kind of read, to look at the way they had approached or did certain things, how people did certain things. They collected a lot of writings on places. So whether it was travel, whether it was fiction, historical fiction, just collected a lot of writing on on places. And this became an exercise of getting closer to some of that writing because you know I also went through an exercise of you know whether I should write it with my hand, whether I should use the classic typewriter, what to do. I simply worked on the form, finally. But the whole idea of you know like uh, sitting and reading through a book and typing it is a process of getting to know a text well, actually. I don't know how this, in any sense, answers your your quest or question of uh, time. But for me, it was only this kind of putting the place in the in the context. And I think the, the whole notion of visiting and travel as the thing of dislocating places constantly, or people, I feel, dislocate places all the all the time. And yeah. that's how I interpret it. I mean, why we think of the meeting is actually what's been uh, going on in my head is also the, the travel time. So while you're traveling, mm. you actually do very different things from when you reach and before you travel. Mm. And uh, those those times sometimes become the time that you discover new things or you got you get on to thinking things or doing things which you haven't done for a long time or talking to someone new which starts off new threads right. and trees. But so yeah, I mean in that sense I really yeah, relate to what Actually, a lot of concepts also, like for example, the concept of the exotic, again has something to time with place, and that comes up very strongly when you're talking of traveling. Actually, the concept of uh, strangers and acquaintances. So whether it's the James Jacobs uh, definition or it's the definition of traveling, the whole notion of uh, encountering people you think you know but you don't know. So you know the character type, but you don't know the person per se. So there are these kind of concepts which started emerging uh, quite uh, importantly. Actually. But I was also wondering what, uh, where do you take this in your process mm -hmm. in terms of articulating? Like there was this notion of traveling, with, uh, of walking, that the mm -hmm. situation is had, which they call drifting. Mm -hmm. But they basically took it in the direction of saying you can't get to Noah City before you get lost in it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for them it was all about getting lost without all about not reading maps, not mm -hmm. accessing you know, information which told them rather than them experience. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, we, I mean, mm -hmm. do you articulate uh, some aphorism like that from, from your experience of walking? Uh, mm. Or do you actually want to that? No. Uh, no, I mean, like, yes, yes, no, no, the thing is, yes, yes I'm just wondering if there's anything more to the yes, uh, actually. Which is to say that, uh, see, in the, in the Alice uh, Buleshwar project also, what is there that there is no conscious performance of the walking. But in the way the text is written, it's kind of an on-the-foot description. Where the description becomes a deep description or a thick description in that, in that sense. And once the physical description of a space or a building starts becoming a deeper or a thicker, thicker description, it starts taking on the role of discussing certain aspects about, about what I would like to see as as understanding the cultural sense of space or understanding for example a migration history of a place or understanding a familial structure or a social structure of relationships that exist within that space or that is kind of either hidden or that is kind of partly exposed in the way the kind of the building or the facade or the face of it is rendered. 
So in a sense, it's not much about coming up with some kind of an aphorism rather than kind of the, the whole idea of, of doing it and kind of producing some kind of a reading. And, and for me, at the end of the day, that, the, that as the reading kind of stacks up, it gives you some kind of a presentation. So also kind of Alice in Bhuneshwar is about Bhuneshwar. It at the end of the day is about a city neighbor. Or at the end of the day, it is about a city experience. So in a sense, this this kind of, at least the, the structure of the book, this one has more of an essay structure where I think these things will only, these things will only emerge as as uh, as an appendix or a, or a description in an in an essay which will talk about the notion of walking to collective kind of a thing or the notion of understanding details of, of, of architecture for example and then kind of getting into the question of space and experience from details in, in architecture. So when you talk of collecting, huh. do you uh, mean collecting just tangible things or also no. tangible experiences? And I think collecting I mean is more in a sense of, 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 of being this uh, self who's allowing a lot of things to pile on over it over itself and then kind of uh, using that using that pile up of, of things over a over a period of time and obviously you're pulling out what you want at a certain point and not bothering about the about the rest and things like that. But I also also kind of this implies not just in a process way, but it also implies in a sense that you know how do we position ourselves or live live ourselves in the sense of a, of being in a community or being in a being in a being in a city that we are essentially uh, structuring ourselves within sets of relationships and those relationships are then structured within our sense of space and within our sense of movement. So it's also that 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 uh, as a person who experiences a particular set of uh, life patterns in a city is also collecting. So, so to perform the collector as a researcher is also in a sense uh, performing the collector that one does as a citizen, as a person who is occupying space in the in the city. So it also kind of relates to relates to that. That ultimately we, otherwise why do you, why do you for example like certain kind of buildings? Why do you like certain kind of furniture? Why do you like certain images? So in a sense, we are all kind of producing and reproducing our collections and our, our scenes through these through these forms, actually. So the whole idea of migrant community going for a particular kind of an architectural pattern, architectural structure, or architectural patterns moving over a period of time is indicative of this relationship that people have with the sense of how they've collected their history. And whether it's kind of a, a, a collected memory within a community, within a large family, or it's otherwise. And this kind of then goes into a lot of my works of looking at the detailed structure, the detailed studies of, of buildings, like how, for example, Charles in Bombay have a sense of a rural joint family, joint family life, and whether the building is a building or the building is a neighborhood itself. So then it kind of goes into these kind of uh, questions. So more than the kind of coming up with a moral of the story, the idea is to use these methods in producing what you want to produce or what you have an aim of kind of producing and structuring over a period of time. Okay.